Okay, so we're going to get started with the second half of uh, this morning's symposia. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Uh, Wolfram Tetzlaff, uh, who uh, started out by getting an MD in Germany a long time ago. You wrote, uh, so we, but we won't we won't get into that right South now. South of the nine, okay. 1970s. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> uh, and he then did a postdoc at the Max Planck in Munich uh, with a Dr. Kreutzberg. Uh, came to Canada in 1986 uh, as a postdoctoral fellow, but then decided that uh, he should also do a PhD, which he completed in 1989. Uh, he then moved on to, uh, I guess, if you did your heritage, you might have stayed in uh, Calgary, at least initially as an assistant professor, and then moved on to the University of Ottawa, where he was an associate professor, and then finally went to uh, sunny Vancouver. Uh, in 1995 uh, to uh, join, uh, to join uh, UBC. He now holds the uh, Rick Hansen Chair uh, in Spinal Cord Injury Research and is currently Director of i which is the International Collaboration on Repair Discoveries. So I have to correct you, you there right away. Thank you so much for the <laughs> kind introduction. It's interim. Interim. Oh, we've, I'm sorry. We've, we've, we have to find out what the, where this goes. <laughs> thank you so much for the kind introduction. Also, thank you to the organization committee. It's a great honor to come here today. Unfortunately, I missed my connection last night in Toronto, and they put me up in a, what was it again, an executive suite, I was supposed to say. Uh, I wouldn't quite call it that way. Never mind. It was a very short night. And <laughs> never mind. I made it here, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad. And I only missed about five minutes of your talk, I believe. Great. OK. Um, what I'm going to present to you are some preclinical strategies we like to work on in order to see where this might be going when we all have the same goal, finding cures for spinal cord injury. And in the first half of my talk, I will take you through some dietary approach, which is a very neglected area in spinal cord injury and in many areas. And the second part, I look at some particular type of cells for treatment. I don't want to uh, start without first acknowledging my people because sometimes when you get out of, run out of time, you forget what the people have done the work. Initially, I will, will talk about my, the work of my postdocs, Vought Plant and Femke Strider, and later on this transplantation work done in conjunction with the collaboration with the work we, uh, we do with Dr. Frieda Miller in Toronto here and Jeff Bianaski in Calgary now. Okay, what happens in the spinal cord injury? Most of you know when a bone fragment hits the spinal cord, we get a primary injury in the middle of the spinal cord. This is expanding in a secondary damage cascade. We get in the wake of that demyelination. We have axonal damage. We have essentially failure of regeneration. And the result of this is typical degeneration of tracts and disconnection of neural networks, some of the uh, fibers here are failing to conduct, and generally functional failure is the result. And uh, this is, of course, happening in some more or less complete, incomplete way, way of the theme. And depending on the level, the neuronal damage itself at the lesion site may play also an additional role. We are, of course, focusing in the spinal cord field on different stages. And this is really a slide for the lay people in the audience. Of course, the thinking is maybe we can protect some of the initial damage. Then, of course, at some point, we have to also entertain the need to repair a particular where there is nothing to protect or where protection has failed or because there was not sufficiently there to protect. And then, of course, and this is the only therapy that works so far in the clinics, although nobody really knows how to do it and what to do, what is the best, is rehabilitation. And you will hear today from our distinguished awardee of the Taylor Prize that stimulation and other mechanisms to enhance this trick will also have a magic effect, and I very much look forward to that. The ultimate therapy may be very well in a combinatorial approach, and the vision here is that you probably early on t focus on some neuroprotective strategy, which you then later on combine with some neuro repair and rehabilitation approaches. Nutrition. Why nutrition? Well, about uh, some, almost 20 years ago, we started to focus on neurotrophic factors, treated our animals, and in the early last decade, we realized that we treat our animals with neurotrophic factors, in particular brain-derived neurotrophic factors. We got nice effects, but we also saw massive weight loss in these animals, and one of these companies is actually now pursuing this weight loss effect 
to actually focus on adipositas rather than actually neuro diseases. And this actually intrigued us, and my postdoc, in those days still student, Ward Plunnett, was thinking, well, what, this weight loss is still actually a compounding factor. We should look into that. And he was very much interested in, 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 in diets and, and, and caloric restriction and all these kind of very much on uh, approaches. And we looked into the actual nutritional guidelines of spinal cord injury as well. And lo and behold, it's relatively limited. We, we, we see essentially in the recent guidelines that an appropriate nutrition, not well defined, uh, when resuscitation has been completed and, and there is no evidence of shopping, to be fed with a standard polymeric enteral formula. And my uh, conjecture is that probably we have to revise this and we will come to this back later at a little while why I think so. Um, of course, this is an evidence based pretty much on class three evidence and, of course, on experts' opinions and really uh, very much driven by the polytrauma literature, the burn literature, and we have to be a TBI literature, but SCI patients may behave differently. And from what the animal models tell us, we may actually see some special requirements here. And we published on this. Uh, uh, in the middle of the last decade, yeah, a long time ago, according to Sasha's, Sasha's time scale. Uh, my time scale is a bit different, <laughs> never mind. Uh, we found that if we uh, dietarily restrict rats uh, every other day taking the food away after an injury, initiating this after an injury, we get better outcome from cervical spinary, spinal cord injury as well as better outcome also from contusion injury. Uh, well, we presented this at several meetings, and the effects were quite impressive. This is essentially a lesion hole in a, a cervical spinal cord in a control animal. And this is an animal that was put on a diet, which we called every other day fasting. So in other words, the first day after injury, this animal was not seeing any food. Then day two, got food. Day three, no food. Day uh, five food. So this intermittent fasting regimen, and then we looked six weeks later and plotted the lesion sizes, and there was a dramatic neuroprotection here, and that went also along with behavioral recoveries in four limb function. However, when we presented this at meetings, uh, we really got very little enthusiasm for that, and there were huge concerns of weight loss. I remember Michael Felix was also very much I mentioned Wolf, I don't think you will be able to get this anywhere because these people are already losing a lot of weight and uh, psychological barriers to withhold nutrition. There will be also lack of compliance. So I got all these kind of critiques and I actually believe the people are right. And Michael, I really thank you for this input. I think you're absolutely dead on here because it forced us to rethink the whole thing. And of course, what can mimic some aspects of, of caloric restriction and, and fasting is actually a diet called ketogenic diet. And a ketogenic diet is a diet very low in carbohydrates. Femke Streiger initiated that, another very gifted postdoc in my laboratory, now research associated with Dr. Brian Kwan. And what, hap uh, what we have to say about ketogenic diet is it was actually known since the 1920s that this is actually effective for epilepsy treatment in a kind of anecdotal way. And it was th this was totally forgotten and abundant when the pills came out, the phenytoins and all, all these other pills. And then in the 1990s, it was rediscovered because of the story of Charlie Abrams and uh, uh, child sufferings from severe epilepsy, and this resulted in, uh, essentially in a revival of this, and even the creation of the Charlie Foundation, uh, because this child actually seemed to respond to, the diet, to this diet. And very recently, again, not in Sasha's scale, but uh, 2008 and 2009, we saw randomized clinical trials, and it was clearly proven to be effective in a subset of children with drug-resistant, I emphasize this, drug-resistant epilepsy. The really bedridden children that would have the option to go to surgery otherwise, and that is, of course, the question whether you'd rather go into that or not. And it's very interesting, in some of these kids, after several years on this diet, the system is actually stabilizing itself, and you would always um, I think that the brain that is not constantly bombarding itself with repeated seizures has then the capacity to somehow 
be self-repairing. And that's interesting to, to, to observe in some of these cases. So the, 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 the argument here is that drugs can be actually, sorry, diets can be actually more effective than drugs. And I strongly believe it's the case, although they're awfully dirty, and I explain to that later. What are the mechanisms? Well, the mechanisms are very multiple fold. And I'm sure Sasha has some comments later because we come from two areas onto the same pathways in the end. Um, ketogenic bodies can be used as fuels for mitochondria and they burn cleaner with less free oxygen radical uh, uh, formation and therefore fewer uh, uh, byproducts, which are damaging. They're also <laughs> driving up antioxidants, the glutathione synthase, for instance. And we see very interesting competition of ketone bodies with at the vesicular glutamate uptake uh, uh, binding site. And this is uh, relevant because uh, they can thereby deplete the neurons, so to say, of the glutamate physical <coughs> contents, which then is one possible mechanism how this could actually dampen excitotoxicity and excitability. And in a very observational uh, descriptive way, if you take CSF from a human being on the ketogenic diet and throw it on, on hippocampal tissue slices and look at the uh, action potentials there, you just get an, a, a long after hyperpolarization of the calcium channels, which means these neurons in these slices are less excitable. And so we have here a dampening effect. And many of these effects may somehow uh, be underlining that therapeutic effect in epilepsy, but we do also know that after spinal cord injury, there is an excitotoxic component, there is a strong mitochondrial component, and there may be many, many other components, and this diet is just tapping into several pathways at the same time, and I return to that in a little while. Okay, uh, for this reason, because it's so broad and at the same time so, so dirty, uh, it has been actually previously applied to several uh, models like traumatic brain injury, cerebral ischemia, Alzheimer's and Parkinson models, but also in limited human trials, and there's anecdotal evidence of efficacy in some of these, but we have to be really, really careful with those data because these are open labeled and those uh, nothing really randomized contrast, so, so the evidence quality of our level is actually relatively low, but it's intriguing and it should actually give us some food for thought, no pun intended here. Um, so the, uh, we took it to the field of spinal cord injury, that's what Femke started, and she did it in a cervical hemicontusion, and this model is now described in the Journal of Visual Experimentation. And the reason why we use cervical hemicontusions is very much driven by Kim Anderson's work, because Kim Anderson told us uh, eight years ago, well, folks, um, you do all these thoracic contusion injuries, but really the folks with spinal cord injury that are having cervical injuries, far and foremost, they want hand function back. What it really means, they want independence back, provided they're not on the respirator, which would be then the first priority. And so what, what, what we did essentially is giving these rats a hemicontusion here, and testing their limb usage with uh, grooming tests, rearing tests, pellet reaching tests, just typical tests that we think could model somewhat uh, the, the human scenario. Rats do grab quite nicely, as you see in a moment. And what we did then is after the injury, we started these animals on this diet, which in essence contains uh, virtually no, hydro, uh, no carbohydrates, it's high in fat. This is the standard diet, which has a high carbohydrate content. The ketogenic diet is down to three here. And, and uh, in contrast, the fat content is really high and the protein content is 18%. That's the clinical formulation, which typically is referred to as a three to one ketogenic diet. And this is essentially the, the, the profile of, of these types of fats in there for those aficionados. And this is how your day looks on a ketogenic diet. So you might end, start up with an egg and bacon and tuna celery salad with some creamy dressing, a cheeseburger with lettuce and green beans, and some heavy dipping cream and some strawberries. That means one or two. And it's really a, a diet which is not necessarily very palatable for everybody. And the compliance is always an issue here. So what do we see in the animals? Uh, our, we got, of course, an industrial formulation, as you saw before. Of course, rats don't like a new diet, so the first two days they don't eat as much as the other ones. So there's initially a slightly more pronounced weight drop, and that is taken up very easy. Uh, soon. It's compensated within about 
two, two, three weeks, and in the end, essentially, the animals weigh the same. So this is not a pro uh, prolonged body weight loss. So we really achieve something here without the body weight loss, which is important, and to prove that these kids are actually fasting and nobody was sneaking in some food into the cage. Uh, we see here, obviously, uh, an increase in ketone bodies. Um, so what does it do to behavior? Uh, one of the tests we like a lot is this grooming test. And this grooming test is essentially uh, done by putting a drop of water on the back of the hat, and they don't like them. They start grooming it off, and this is the, what the rats do. And this requires the ability to put the paws up and wipe it off. And when we do this here, we see here, we have done it now twice in two cohorts of rats. We see here a highly significant difference on a she uh, square test that these animals on the ketogenic diet reach further behind than those animals that are on the standard diet. Well, uh, another aspect of reaching is grasping, grasping for a pellet or grasping for a piece of food. And when we put these pellets on, a, on these Montoya staircase tests here, we drop the first two staircases because the first two steps they can lick out with the tongue. And that's not really what you want to test. You want to test reaching with the paw. And when we see this here, we see here, this is our first and our second cohort here, the number of pellets eaten. There's a significant difference here in the animals eating a ketogenic diet as opposed to the ones on the standard diet, pretty much twice as many pellets eaten. And when we look at what well number they do that, we neglect these the guys here. This is really what matters. These guys can reach. This is done with the tongue here. So really, this is the, what the, the effect we are looking here for. And there's a dramatic ability difference in, in terms of being able to reach as opposed to standard diet animals. And this is also seen in a more sophisticated test, which you can only do with lighter injuries, but you can do it. And this is essentially what you see here from the front in a human being reaching through a slot. Let's say the person in the bank in the old days just reaching out for a banknote in front of you. And this is what you see in a rat. Very similar kind of movement to grass that has this advanced movement in the brachial. And again, when we do this here, we see here not all animals responding. That may be the, the variability in the lesion. That may be uh, the biological variability. But we see a significant difference uh, in, in at least half of the cohorts that are strongly responding it to, compared to the standard diet. And another test here is the usage in the cylinder. The rats are in, intrinsically curious. They're right in their paws. And when they are uh, uprighting themselves, they're actually exploring their environment. And this is, essentially, is the usage here plotted here, being essentially uh, much more frequent. And this effect lasts even beyond the duration of the diet. So when we stop it at 12 weeks, we still see the effect at 14 and 16 weeks. So what are the mechanisms? Uh, we see a gray matter protection, not so much a white matter protection. That's an important point to make here. So there's, this is may, maybe uh, explaining why we see significant effects on the cervical injury models. We do not see a strong effect with thoracic models. We then ventured into, am I too close to this? I'm sorry for that. Uh, we ventured into a gene array, and there are many pathways regulated here. Overall, what I can say is at the moment is we see about, uh, with this type of cutoff criteria, we use 1,200 genes upregulated in a standard diet animals. The ketogenic diet animals have only half the amount of genes upregulated to that 1.5 startup cutoff criterion, but actually it was 1.7 in that case. So really there's that, but also we then picked up a couple of our best friends, and the first one we picked was actually the transporter system, because we asked ourselves, is this really a, a ketone-mediated effect or some dirty schmutz effect on the other side? Is that mediated to the transporter itself? Because the transporter, this NCT1 molecule, the monocarboxylic <coughs> transporter, is upregulated, upregulated uh, by RNA uh, gene array, but also upregulated by Western blotting and by immunocytochemistry. This is in the standard animal under identical conditions here in the ketogenic diet animal. And this is a quantification of these plots. And the uh, answer is, does it matter? And is there anything that we can actually functionally prove that it plays a role? So we went to mice for, for two reasons. A, we wanted to show that there's neuroprotection in a second species. And again, with a certain <coughs> hemicontusion model here, this is, Femke developed this model recently. 
And we see here on the actual area of the injury with the standard diet. This is here the area of the injury with ketogenic diet. And we used now a uh, pharmacological drug as the first step towards transgenic animals to prove this mechanism, which essentially is called FOSIN. Don't ask me what the abbreviation is. The point is that this drug inhibits the monocarboxylate transporters. And it's fairly specific and we lose our protective effect if we treat these animals. So we have strong evidence here, or some evidence here, that this is most likely working by the, the actual uh, ketones themselves, because their uptake mechanism, if you block it, is necessary for this. What we also see is a significant decrease in inflammation in animals uh, uh, on the ketogenic diet. This is here the influx of macrophages with an antibody to ED1. Uh, at seven days, uh, as opposed to the one on standard diets. And again, in our arrays, this is exactly what happened, that some of these, this is very, very new data, and we, we are in the process to start to analyze this, that inflammatory pathways are dampened down in the animals on ketogenic diet. Not new, but in the context of the ketogenic literature, because others have described less inflammatory markers with injections of formaldehyde into the pores as a model of the pain model. So we actually see quite a bit of this evidence in other systems, except nobody has done it with spinal cord. So we see uh, uh, improved fallen function. We see essentially that the effect remains stable and that there's neuroprotection, uh, in particular neuroprotection of the gray matter, and that one mechanism may be, uh, which tells you that these ketones are involved uh, uh, in the upregulation of transporters for energy metabolism. We see also an increased blood vessels and reduced inflammation, and I didn't go to all the data here. I make a variation here, and I switch now gears. To, uh, where do we take this? We, uh, we actually just would like to throw out for the time being that the clinicians may want to revisit their guidelines for nutrition because we may actually be able to feed patients with better formulations than what we do at the moment. Maybe we have to take glucose out, maybe we find better ways of, of doing this for the time being. But really, as a scientist, you want to understand these things, that's clear. But for the time being, you could envision to take this to a trial because it's clinically used. People are, uh, have developed clinical formulations, although there's room for improvement here. And when we mentioned this to our Chinese colleagues, they were very eager to do this. And as a matter of fact, they already have, just to see the feasibility of what, what, what is possible to do, they have already fed this to four of their patients. And I, I would say this is interesting. Uh, we have to be cautious because the problem to do trials with China is obviously, do they have the same assessment standards and so on and so on. There are lots of link, things to learn, but I'm excited about it, that they are so excited about it, because it would be a cheap way of treating, uh, in particular, the third world, the spinal cord injuries are very, very uh, broad. Okay, uh, second part, you cannot rescue everything, you cannot protect everything, and I would predict that with severe injuries, these diet effects would be probably much, much less. And therefore, we need to think about a repair mechanism, and we started uh, to think about cells, and everybody thinks about uh, treating with cells in one way or the other. And what is really, this is a picture here for some lay people, what is the role of a stem cell in the spinal cord? Well. Uh, one could think of a stem cell as a cell that goes in and remyelinates these demyelinated axons here in the periphery of an injury, or of a cell that is uh, filling the injury site itself, providing a guided structure for axons to grow through, or to replace neuronal networks within the lesion sites, and then uh, potentially you would be in an optimistic situation get the uh, this year down to the spinal cord. And we have recently a paper in Cell that showed us that this mechanism here is definitely one of the possibilities. What I'm focusing on is a cell that is providing these guidance structures as well as the ability to remyelinate. And uh, I, I will not spend much time on, uh, on this slide here. I will just try to say when everybody is focusing on pluripotent stem cells, typically derived from the skin, we are focusing on another skin-derived cell, which was derived, uh, discovered in the laboratory of Dr. Miller in Toronto. Uh, actually, Jane Tuma was discovering it there about a decade ago. And this is, these are called skips. And this is a 
There's a progenitor cell living in the hair papilla, responsible to EGF, and these are grown and then uh, flown to us for experimentation. The big advantage is, like inducible pluripotent cells, they are readily available. Uh, they can be pre-differentiated into Schwann cells. You tweak them in the protocol I'm talking about in a moment. And they're suited for autologous transplantation. With all the problems and pros and cons, we like to favor this approach because there's no need for immunosuppression and other uh, limitations. But of course, there are logistic issues here. Uh, this is, of course, far less ethically contentious than embryonic of, of fetal stem cells. And this is, problem is now overcome with inducible pluripotent cells which have their own limitations. And they are much less likely, these cells here, to produce tumors or have abnormalities, which we see in IPS lines, which have to be very carefully screened. And there are also nice skips are found in adult humans. So how are they derived? They're essentially dissociated and treated with FGF, EGF. They form those spheres, and then they are cultured again. Yes, that's the same picture many times again, but this is how they look. They form these. And then uh, they can be with force coding and be regularly tweaked into Schwann cells. And uh, despite the fluid restrictions on airlines, we can fly these cells in the, in the passenger compartment uh, to and through Canada. It doesn't really create a big obstacle. We just have to write the appropriate letters and they're trusters. So these are getting characterized before, before we put them into the spinal cords. And uh, this is what you see here. If, transplanted seven days after injury. These are, this is a control situation after 12 weeks, and transplanted at seven days, and we see here a big hole of this medium injected and uh, spinal cord, and this is what we see here in the skip in injected spinal cords. This is something we didn't expect, that these rims here, the spared rims here, when we quantify them, are actually uh, significantly thicker than the animals that receive the cells strongly indicating a neuroprotective effect, which was somewhat unexpected at that time point. And what we, it was, was quite nice to see that these cells integrated nicely, proximally and distally into the spinal cord. What the cells also were able to do is to get into the host ring where they yeah, are presumably uh, demyelinated axons. And uh, these cells are clearly here now forming the morphological features of myelinating cells, and we see also the typical Romulo markers expressed here. So they're remyelinating, they're not only filling the lesion site itself, they're also remyelinating spared axons. And uh, this is here further quantified here in the, this picture that, where we just show the number of PCO positive profiles in these lesion sites. Uh, behaviorally, the, the effect was modest, and I learned actually myself now as we do this more and more, we stopped this experiment too early. These beneficial effects take at least seven, eight weeks to develop. Uh, the good news was we saw significant effects in locomotion, but it's, this is discrete. You would not take something based on this to a trial. Uh, but what we also saw, which was interesting, when we look at sensory function, and we always have to do sensory function when we put in cells because of the problem of uh, uh, um, uh, neuropathic pain, which you might induce, that the undifferentiated cells, those were not driven to the Schwann cell phenotype, were actually lowering pain thresholds, sensory thresholds, I should say. And that, the implication here is that this may be indicative of, of pain, while the differentiated cells did not do that. So that was good news, and we were quite delighted about this. Well, if you really want to take this to a uh, approach in human beings, what we would have to do is, of course, uh, this is just some up of what the cell do in a good setting, is to think about this in a more chronic setting. Because if you want to do it, uh, you need to take the patient's skin. You have to grow these cells up. And that takes at least five, maybe eight weeks. And therefore, we, we designed essentially a five weeks pilot project and an eight, eight week study. And this is what you see from this five weeks pilot study. This is, in green, the labeled cells that come from a transgenic rat, which express this green fluorescent protein. There's very good integration in the injured spinal cord. But lo and behold, there is a whole other population of P0 expressing Schwann cells of endogenous origin. And we don't know whether they are endogenous from the cord or outside. But these are filling this lesion site and well. So this mechanism here is enhancing an endogenous repair response when we look at, at this here in a transplant which went into the cord at 
five weeks after injury and using an endpoint here of 13 weeks after injury. With the high power magnification, we see thousands of axons going into these bridges. In red here, the axons. In green, those cells transplanted. And there are uh, they're just a massive guidance structure for axons, which are some of them, of course, of peripheral origin, because we can stain some of them for markets. If you go to the spare grid, again, as even in this five-week setting, you see a beautiful integration here now into those denuded axons of the rim. And lo and behold, some of the endogenous cells participate in this process as well. So can we take this to the eight-week point? In other words, can we transplant these cells eight weeks after injury? Uh, so the injury is done here. We do all this baseline behavior, follow up with the, with the uh, behavior over this time, and then at 29 weeks post-injury, we sacrifice these animals. This is what you see. This is 29 weeks after injury with the transplant at eight weeks. These are four different, five different transplants here as they are surviving and integrating into the injured spinal cords and living there for many, many, many weeks. Uh, and this is what you get when you plot all the data. Some of our animals have poor survival. Some of them have quite decent survival in the order of 12, 15%, which is, with this type of approach, pretty much what, what uh, people report as good results, because many of the cells die already on arrival. Uh, there's very little proliferation going on, which would suggest there's very little danger of tumor formation. As a matter of fact, we never saw tumors with this type of approach. Uh, nothing which looked like a schwannoma or anything along that line, which would have a, a proliferative index, which would be at least 20 times higher. What was very delightful to us is to see that at this time point here, the actual scar itself was, this is actually a lesion site with the transplant inside. And the astrocytes have a very loose, fuzzy interface with the actual transplant. And this is what the control scenario is showing us here, a very sharp demarcation of now what appears to be an empty cavity at 29 weeks. I will show you data later how this actually does look at the time of transplantation. Well, these uh, 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 edges here are expressing high amounts of neurocons and GFP, CF56. And of course, those are these molecules that Arthur Brown was so nicely saying that he, we should uh, prevent from forming. And of, when we put these cells in, this is exactly what we're doing here, too. We actually have much less uh, of the expression of GFAP in neurocon. And this is happening here at the interface of such a transplant. So this is the same section in different colored channels, looking at CS56, neurocon, and GFAP, showing that this interface is preserved as such. It's not uh, back-regulated, and I'll show you in a moment. Also, there's an enormous amount of laminin now, which comes from these cells, plus also from endogenous Schwann cells. So these cells are integrating very well into the lesion site. They bridge these lesion sites. And again, in this eight-week transplantation paradigm, they are uh, attracting thousands of axons crossing these bands of these lesions. And some of them are, this is significantly, these animals have significantly more axon in their total width of spinal cord. These are just one optical slice count. And these are the axons from the rim, spare rim left and right. And these are the axons uh, that you see in addition to the actual lesion with the skip transplant. So I would assume there would be the similar number in the rim because protection is not that much happening or the rims get thicker. But there's another reason why that is. But the number of axons here is mainly due to uh, uh, probably three times that many now making it through those, uh, in those bridges. Um, I said through, there was a bit of a lapsus, but sorry, this should not have happened. This is, oh, it's a projection mistake, I'm sorry. This is the distal interface of such of these bridges where these axons are coming through. These are 5 HT axons from the brainstem, really apologize, entering out here and making it down into the distal spinal cord, which, oh, sorry. I don't know why that happened. Okay, too bad. Um, and here we see uh, that these Schwann cells, I'm sorry for that, uh, that these Schwann cells are also uh, in that late transplant paradigm clearly remyelinating. This is an axon in blue here, surrounded in red with a myelin sheath, and in green, this uh, myelin sheath, which essentially is uh, 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 showing the outer cytoplasmic layer of the Schwann cells. And this is interesting here. When we quantify the number of Schwann cells now in these spinal cords, we see increasingly over time 
This is at the time of transplant, we took other animals and did a control at, at the time of transplant. Over time, we see more and more and more Schwann cells in these spinal cords. This is the surviving fraction. And obviously, this transplantation lures in or promotes the formation of, uh, and I just can discuss that later, other cells pro also producing these P0 profiles. And we see this now here. And the massive individual is significantly different from the controls. And so we're enhancing here an endogenous repair process in this uh, uh, manner. Functionally, what happens is if we are looking at a BBB here, that we, and we can randomize these animals very nicely and completely blind ourselves what is happening, that those animals that are receiving these cells are now seeing a further improvement on the BBB. There's a later decline, and I can discuss that because it's constant immunosuppression, they get older, and other factors are coming in here. And by 21, 19 weeks, there are significantly different from the control cohorts. And we see this also in other parameters, like looking at um, Height and stridement, for instance, where we see here differences in, in the media as opposed to the skip Schwein cells, where we clearly see uh, significant effects between those two cell types. Well, another collaborator, and I'm done in a minute, uh, another compounding uh, interesting byproduct, which was almost like an ad, a post hoc analysis, uh, was looking at the bladder, because bladder function is one of the major problems we see in, in individuals with spinal cord injury. And we took out the bladders, measured the thicknesses, and uh, there is uh, some literature telling us that thickenings in the bladder may be some indicative of some bladder sphincter uh, synergies or sphincter uh, increases, and therefore bladder wall desynchronization. And what we see is actually a significant higher uh, amount of the bladder wall thickness in those media treated controls as opposed to those animals here on the Skip Schwann cells treatment. And this is highly correlated here on the uh, BBB scores where we plot here the bladder wall thickness against the uh, mean BBB score and essentially we have the same situation here. So obviously there is some correlation with the well meaning and that. So where would we take it from there? Obviously, uh, we, we have to work with human skip derived cells. This is what we started now. We have done a whole uh, experiment now with cervical injuries, and these animals have been now uh, perfused, and uh, we're looking into these, but we have some problems in this paradigm, which I am happy to discuss later off, off line. Uh, we have to go to more severe injuries. I feel that for cell transplantation, these injuries where the controls are around about BBB12 or so, they're just too light. Nobody would in that serious mind really consider uh, a cell treatment unless there are some desperate reasons uh, to actually treat because that would correspond most likely, well, nobody knows what it corresponds to, but would most likely correspond to an Asia C able to walk on crutches. And therefore, it's, it seems to me that the field is actually chasing somewhat uh, for the low hanging fruit here, but we have to really consider if you want to do transplantations, in particular with a cell that called bridges, that's important, yeah, it depends on the type of cell, that we have to essentially go to more severe models. We have to combine these therapies with some ray training and perhaps also with electrical stimulation, very much this idea coming from the uh, lab from our distinguished guest today, and this is why I put it in there. Yes, Dredge will be thinking of you all the time, and of course we have to take this to large animal models, and Brian Kwan, my colleague, has now established a big model, which is absolutely wonderful, and we have to do more science to actually understand this. And one of the approaches we are taking now is P10 SOX divisions here in some genetic mouse lines. What is the corollary? It's the last slide I show. Is really an interesting finding that the eight-week spinal cord is not a chronically injured spinal cord. This is really good news, and we, hopefully we see the same in humans because uh, we have to go now back to the pathology databases. Here you see a GFAP demarcation around a lesion site at 28, 29 weeks after injury. This is what well, can you then? That's very nice. Thank you. Um, this is the actual lesion site at the time when we put these cells in. Yes, there is an increase in GFAP as opposed to normal. Normal is something like this here. So it's clearly there, but it depends how you really set your threshold and how you tweak your channels on the microscope to put it in relative uh, density to each other. And this is relatively open compared to this sharp margin here. And this is 
containing some axons. See, we know this is containing laminin, this is containing some Schwann cells, and probably what happens is if you put our cells in there, they actually find an environment in which they can enhance what I call at this moment a residual repair process or residual spare, sparing process, which would otherwise be cleared out by macrophages and then stabilizing this, and this taking this here to uh, the bridges we saw later. Well, this is good news. I think the time window for cellular repairs in the interspinal cord may be much larger than hitherto believed, and that delayed transplantations are feasible and successful, and even without any co-treatments, which could actually make the uh, approval better, but I think co-treatments will make it more effective. And of course, this has ramifications when you want to design clinical trials, because you could now delay the actual treatment by several months, which means the actual spontaneous recovery curves of these individuals is much less predict, and thereby you can more precisely predict their, their ultimate outcome. You need fewer subjects for a trial. Uh, the participants have more time to think about a trial and understand the ramifications of trial participation, which is really complicated, and autologous approaches would become feasible. And one last note here that I think there is not one cell for all because of the different ways the spinal cord can get injured. And we learned from our co local colleagues at iCord, Dr. Oxland, engineers by training, that if you injure the cord in different mechanisms, contusion, dislocation, distraction, you get a completely different histology. And we actually may see more re demyelination lesions in some of these more uh, gray matter defects, more uh, um, uh, 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 the shearings where we have to produce regeneration, and really there may be different cells for different tasks, and this is where I think, in a sort of personalized way, cell transplantation ought to go in the future. Well, I have to particularly thank you Peggy Assing who, and Joe Sparling, who were the, the preeminent grad students on those transplantation protocols. I already acknowledged them with Stryker on the transplantation, and my dear collaborators in Toronto, and as well as in Calgary, Jeff Bianaski now, and Dr. Brian Kwan uh, locally in Vancouver. This is a shot from the roof of our building in Vancouver. This are the mountains here. This is our downtown, Falls Creek here. Our institute is, as I say, a bit beneath me. And of course, this has been stretched a bit in PowerPoint. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, just in, the, in, the, yeah, in PowerPoint. And I would like to acknowledge our funding agencies. Thank you so much for your attention. Arthur? Well, do you have a feeling for how much of the effect is due to endogenous Schwann cells likely and how much is due uh, to the transplanted cells, and whether or not, so many different cell paradigms have been shown to be somewhat helpful. Do any of those others draw in Schwann cells from the periphery, and maybe that's where we're going? I think it's a very good question. I think this one picture where I showed you that only 15% of the Schwann cells in that Court, are actually the ones we transplanted, would say that the, the majority of the repair is then done by the endogenous cells. But you can enhance that by having those transplanted cells. So the, the, the answer is we don't know exactly what the percentage is there. You would then have to take out fraction, this is possible, with mice from mice, cells from mice, and put in some genetic deletions in them, and then see, OK, and you can do it even inducible now, and see, OK, let's take the mining capacity out or whatever, and look. Uh, selectively, uh, at and I think Michael Phoenix has some data to that regard by using uh, cells from shivering mice where the, the myelination is inhibited. And those type of approaches are exactly those mechanistic approaches which are necessary to understand uh, what we are actually doing with these, because these cells are having trophic factors, they're having uh, the ability to myelinate, they're, they're, they're modulating inflammation, the glia response is modulated, so there are many, many mechanisms here, and that's really uh, something you have to understand better. Uh, I agree. Yes. The ketone, the ketogenic diet is very interesting, and you know that we've been following this up as well. Oh, yeah, I know. <laughs> so the question that I have is, is that many of your outcome measures are sort of an indirect inference of how it's worked. Have you considered, and I've talked with Femke about this, why not just put in ketone bodies? Yeah, I know. Uh, 
And actually, after neuroscience, you asked me, asked her again once, and I asked her, so did we do that experiment? Because we discussed it. We had it actually one of the earlier grants we had. And she said, yeah, we did it, but it didn't work. And I said, why? And I asked her exactly, so what, what did you do? Oh, we, we put a pump in, but I'm not sure. So the answer is, we have to do it again. Uh, so I don't know why it didn't work. It should work, and I think you started it, did you? And it works, right? In the great two training okay, okay. Really. okay, so we have to go back. Uh, my, my hunch is that the, the half-life is not very really great on these substances. Well, we give it a huge pumps. That's exactly what you have to do. And the other thing is you have to uh, find the right dose. And maybe we were under dose. Right. Because getting enough of that substance into an osmotic pump is a challenge. Yeah. Yeah. Well, actually, we found that it is to give you less concentrated is better. Ah, interesting. Very interesting. That's really, that's, maybe that's why the diet is better, because it has a lower concentration uh, for the blood protractor. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. On that issue, uh, I'm not surprised that the ketone infusion did not work because you're affecting metabolism. You're affecting so many things, and to think that this is a ketone effect, I think is oversimplification. Uh, the ketone effect is like a big role in the way I, I, I base it on the mouse experiment, where we actually inhibit the ketone uptake specifically in the mouse. And so, so that will tell us at least one block of this. But it doesn't rule out that there are other mechanisms, because we may have a ceiling effect there uh, with regard to the ketone effect itself. And there may be other things. Uh, and this model is, of course, not tight in any way, so we cannot actually say that this is the only flexible. Um, and, I, and I really appreciate that. This is what happening with many diets, and even the preservatory uh, story is going that way. Because if you give it as a mono substance, you fail. If you drink that wine, which has a low content of it and have all the other benefits, you, you get good things. That's the problem with diets in general. We are tapping into so many pathways at the same time in a low dose, which may be a better way of treating the system, but we don't understand that. Very unsatisfying because we like to get a single drug, a single molecule and pill, uh, ideally. But it may not be the answer. So we have to understand this better. Then perhaps we can improve these diets. You see, what we looked for is plasticity, for instance, specifically. We did not see an increase in plasticity with the ketogenic diet, but we saw an increase in plasticity with the intermittent fasting. And those diets are not doing the same at all. They're over on the ketones, but there are many other effects. So. Uh, in the, if I can just add a quick comment, because we've got to move on. In the epilepsy world, which is what I work in, the ketogenic diet, they have shown that the ketones are necessary. The issue that I think you bring up is are they necessary and sufficient? Do, they, do, do you need to add them on to something else that's going on as well? And in fact, um, there's a company that's just started up to look at different ketone uh, molecules to see how uh, epileptic uh, anti-seizure they are. So they're actually looking for ketones other than the ones that you would, like acetone that you would think about right away. So anyways, we better move on. Okay, thank you.